How many of you have your Bibles with you? I didn't say how many of you got your phones with you. I said how many of you got your Bibles with you? Thank you. That's good. Just, just sit right there. It'll be fine. Tell you what, move it down a little bit. I don't want to stumble over it. <laughs> this is a different scripture. You may think you know it, but I don't think you do. As we read it and look at it, you're going to see some things that you might not have ever seen before. Stand with me, please, as we read Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. Let me have one of those those small tapes, CDs. Just give me a thin one. I'll move this up a little bit. There you go. Thank you. In Luke chapter 11, I want to read verses 1 through 13. Let's look at it together. I want to see if you catch something. It came to pass, cut me down a little bit more if you will, please. I'm just still a little bit too loud, guys. Man, y'all are some good looking people. You know that. You really are, I'll tell you. T.D. Jakes up on the platform playing the organ. Was he here the last time I was here? I didn't hear him the last time. You got a T.D. Jakes on the platform and you got one standing over here. Where's he at? There, that's T.D. Jakes right there. <clears throat> it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And, as, and he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day uh, by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, uh, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? Now listen to this carefully. Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go to him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I can't rise and give to you. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he's his friend, and yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many loaves as he needs. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and he that knocketh shall be opened. If a son ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a fish for a serpent? Or a serpent for a fish? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more should your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them and ask him? Now, I'm going to stop right there, but before you're seated, I want to show you something that you, I don't know if you saw this or not. If you look, it didn't say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Did you catch that? It said, Lead us not in temptation, verse 4, but deliver us from evil. It didn't say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Now, what Jesus did here, according to Luke, the doctor, the physician, Luke is telling us that Jesus, they said, teach us how to pray. So he's telling them about, you know, sins and forgiveness and uh, temptation and all that kind of stuff. But then he goes right into this thing about a friend importunity. He's still sticking with the subject of teaching us to pray. Let me show you something about this. If you look in verse 5, he said, which of you shall have a friend small f and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend capital F, lend me three loaves. 
for a friend, small f of mine, is in his journey to come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Now, that small f is friend, but when he knocks on the door and asks the man for help, that is sure enough, sure enough, the friend. That's the Lord. That's God. So, he said, friend, lend me three loaves. For a small elf friend of mine is on his journey to come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. He said, though he will not rise, in verse 8, and give him, because he is his small elf friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. In other words, this capital elf friend will not resist those that's asking for help capital F friend will get out of the bed and do whatever it takes to satisfy his need. Now, you may be seated. Let me get started. Let's look at three things. Jesus said, let me show you three methods of prayer. The simplest method of prayer is ask. A little bit more complicated method of prayer is seek. The most complicated form of prayer is knock. Now what does seek mean? Seek means God, I'm, I'm sorry, not seek, ask. What does ask mean? It means it's God's simplest method of prayer. There's some things that God has that you can get them and access them by simply asking God. Lord, would you let me have so-and-so? Lord, would you bless me with so-and-so? And he said, yes. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. I remember when I first got in the ministry, I was 20 years old right out of Bible school. I was green, didn't know anything hardly about ministry or nothing else. And I'd been preaching there about a month, and one Sunday morning my watch broke. And... Uh, I preached an hour and, hour and 45 minutes that morning. That night, that afternoon, I went home and I said, Lord, I don't have the money to get a watch. I said, would you bless me with a watch? And so that night, a board member brought me a watch. <laughs> and the board member said, I'm going to give you this watch, Pastor, but I want you to use it. <laughs> so I learned that there's some things you get from God by asking, and he'll give it to you. A more complicated form of prayer is not asking, but it's more a little bit more complicated. It's seeking. That means there's some things God has that he's going to sort of hide from you. He's going to see if you're diligent enough to seek after them. But you'll only get them by seeking. Now, every year, used to, years ago, my wife would um, uh, hide Easter eggs for the grandkids, you know. But you know what? When she'd hide those Easter eggs, she wouldn't bury them. She wouldn't get post hole diggers and put them in the ground and bury them. Why? She wanted the kids to find them. You know, an Easter egg hunt means you, you hide the eggs. You don't bury them where they can't find them. She wanted them to find them. So that means she'd put some where the Easter egg, the little blue ones would be sticking out where the kids could see them. And, you know, the golden egg would be sticking out somewhere and they could see them and they'd run to them. And it was like, oh, look at me, me mom. Look at me, poppy. I found these eggs. And I said, yay. You know, but we, we fixed it to where at least they was looking for them and we helped them to find them. God's got some things that he wants you to find and he's going to fix it to where you can find them. But he wants to see, are you serious enough to seek him? And then... Their third most complicated form of prayer is knocking. Knocking means that when you knock, it's up to the Lord strictly if he opens and when he opens. And it's up to you to have patience until he opens. I remember one time, when revival was going, man, Brenda didn't have any time off. You know, we was in church every night, all night long, till daybreak the next morning, many, many weeks and months. People coming in from all over the world. Me and Steve had to stay and pray for everybody. They were there about the thousands. <clears throat> and so, 
We had a day off, a couple of days off for some reason. I don't know what happened. But we had a couple of days off. I hadn't shaved in two days. I don't even know if I took a bath in two days. <laughs> we were dog tired. Brenda had gone somewhere. I was home by myself. And man, while I was sitting there just relaxing, just enjoying nothingness, you know, not even a TV on, I hear a cotton pick and knock at the door. And so I say, I'm not going to answer that. Well, whoever it was on the other side was like this man of importunity. He kept knocking. And so finally I got up. I went in the dining room. And I got, and we had a sort of an inset in our porch from the front porch like that, sort of an inset. So I looked out the window and I could see that there was a car out there in our driveway, but I didn't recognize the car. So I got right up against the window like this and peeked out to see who it was. And I couldn't tell who it was because they stand in the inset. And then they shut, they sat down on the doorbell, started ringing the doorbell. So I just said, I'm going to wait them out. But now let me ask you this question. Suppose this guy that was at the door, suppose he knocked and he, he uh, rang the doorbell and suppose I didn't answer the door, which I didn't, but just suppose he had went out to the trunk of his car and got a ball-peen hammer and a screwdriver and came up to my door and started taking the pins out of the hinges. How many of you knows now it's not knocking, it's not waiting, it's breaking and entering. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So here's what God's saying. I've got some things for you that you can ask and you can receive. Simple. I've got other things that you're going to have to seek me for, and I'm going to let you find them. But I've got some things that's more complicated that you just knock and present yourself, but I'll let you know when I'm going to open the door. But if you go and take your ball-peen hammer and your screwdriver and start taking the pins out of the hinges and you walk through doors I didn't open, there's going to be something on the other side that's going to do you a lot of damage. Are you listening to me? And here's what I want to say. There's been a lot of people that I've pastored through the years that they wanted to do something so bad and they wouldn't wait on God. They knocked, but they couldn't wait on God. They'd go get their ball-peen hammer and the screwdriver, take the pins out of the hinges and walk behind that door and the devil beat the ever-loving snot out of them and then they want to come back and blame me for it yeah. are you understand what I'm saying so God's got some things you'll get by asking some things you'll get by seeking and some things you'll get by knocking so God wants to answer your prayer okay now I want to move into what my subject is tonight in the book of Ephesians it says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I want to take two words out of this and use it for my title. And the words I want to take is, in verse 12, we wrestle. We wrestle. Now I want to tell you something. I'm a pastor. I also am a revivalist. There's no doubt about it. God's laid his hand on me. I go all over the nation and we, we talk about revival. We minister to ministers. But I am a pastor. I've pastored for many years. I know the struggles people go through. I know the struggle that many of you are going through. I don't know you. I don't know your name, but I know exactly what you're going through because we're all part of the human family and everybody basically goes through the same stuff. Just with different names, different locations, and different intensities. But we all go through the same stuff. And whenever I chose to preach on this subject, I wanted to choose those two things. We wrestle, and you'll see it on the screen. There's a boxing match there. There's a boxing ring, a wrestling ring. But it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And don't ever forget that. But against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this present world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want to talk to you tonight about the dynamics of wrestling. And I want to see how you're doing. 
There's four categories listed in the Bible where people wrestle. I know that you'll understand what I'm going to deal with because, like I said, we're all in this thing together. We basically all face the same struggles in life. But I'm going to draw your attention to these four categories. And number one, we wrestle within ourselves. We wrestle with self. Number two, we wrestle with people issues. Not with people, but with people issues. Number three, we wrestle against powers and principalities and rulers of the darkness of this world. And number four, we wrestle as mortal men with an almighty God. So that's the four areas I want to cover. Let's talk first of all about wrestling with ourselves. Every human being, I don't care what color your skin is, I don't care where you live, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you came from, or any other factor that has to do with you in particular, or with me, all of us are birthed into this human realm and we're subject to our environment. All of us are. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a background. And one thing we all have in common is that we wrestle with things inside of us. We really do. We wrestle with things that are inside of us. Personal struggles, inabilities, lack of capabilities. Every one of us has things on the inside that we have wrestled with, maybe all the way back to early, early adolescence. Maybe as far back as in vitro in the womb. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I do not understand what I do. This is in the NIV. I don't understand what I do. He said, for what I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, I do it. I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I just have a problem carrying it out. For I do not the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, that's what I keep doing. He's wrestling with himself. But I see another law at work in me. Listen to this now. This is very important for you to see this. He said, I see another work, a law at work in me, waging war in my mind. I see something that's on the inside of me that wages war against the law of my mind. And it makes me prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Then he says this, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul was saying that on the inside of me I wrestle. I wrestle. I wrote most of your Bible. I wrote most of your New Testament. I had a powerful experience with Christ. I met Him. I talked with Him. I saw Him. He touched me in such a mighty way. I carry great revelation. I have a thorn in my flesh because of the revelation that I carry. But after having all those mighty experiences, I still have inward things that I wrestle with every day. Although I wrote most of your New Testament. I want to ask you a question. If the man that wrote most of your New Testament wrestles with the things on the inside of him, who do you think you are that you're not going to wrestle with the things on the inside of you? He said, I also war in my mental realm. He said, I see another law at work in me. He said, this is a law at work in me. It's a war raged against the law of my mind. It makes me a prisoner of the law of sin that's at work within me. He said, in him, he's not demon possessed. I want to tell you something. Contrary to what many people think, you're probably not demon possessed. <laughs> but there's laws that working, that's working in you, that's working in your flesh and in your mind, that you struggle with and wrestle with every single day, and I've got news for you, it's probably not going to go away anytime soon, 
but you can get the victory over it and wrestle it and pin it to the mat. It was in his fallen makeup. Paul said it's in my fallen makeup. He wrestled often inwardly. He said, I'm fighting with things on the inside of me that I don't want to fight with, but I fight with them almost every day. Now, let me tell you this. In my family, Kilpatrick, there are proclivities, particular proclivities, to our last name. Kilpatrick is Scottish. I used to think it was Irish till revival broke out. And all these people started coming in from Ireland and Scotland, and the Irish said, no, you're not a, Kilpatrick is not one of us, you're Scottish. You're fighting people. You fight, love to fight. And you love to drink. And you're timberjacks, is what you are. My dad was married five times. My mother was his fifth wife. I'm sorry, my, my father was married seven times. My mother was his fifth wife and didn't know it, and he had two more wives after her. I'm his only child out of seven marriages. I have three half-sisters. And when I watched my father as I was coming up, my father hated Pentecost. My father used to beat my mother for taking me to church. My father did not want me, his only child, in a Pentecostal church, and he didn't want a Christian wife, and he certainly didn't want a tongue-talking Christian wife. But my mother got saved under my brother-in-law's tent revival. He married my half-sister. And whenever they got married, he preached tent revivals all over America. Well, he preached a tent revival on First Avenue in Columbus, Georgia. And my mother got saved there. And I was five years old when she got saved. So when my mother got saved, she told my dad, she said, I can't carouse with you anymore. And I can't go out and do the things that we used to do. She said, and besides that, I've got to raise our son in church. And he forbade it, but my mother said, do what you have to do to me, but I don't want my son to go to hell. And she said, do what you have to do. And he said, I'm going to put your stuff out in the yard. When you get home, you, you'll be put out, and you won't be able to come back in this house. And I saw her stuff put out in the grass several times. My mother was not a rebel. She was a sweet woman, great housekeeper, and a pretty woman, and a great wife, very loyal, never disrespectful. But my father used to beat her for taking me to church every Sunday. I'd have to come in after we had to ride the city bus to church and ride the city bus home and then walk home. She'd have to cook lunch. And while she started cooking, my father would start cussing, ranting, raving, mocking tongues, mocking the Holy Spirit. I had to sit there and see it. And he usually wouldn't stop till he drew blood out of her nose or her mouth. And that was a regular fair on Sundays. So there was proclivities in the Kilpatrick name that they hated, including his folks, hated Pentecost. I don't know why. But I have found out that no matter how turned off I was by the things I saw in my father, those things all my life have attempted to manifest in me. And I never would let them. I never would let them. There can be things that you saw in your father when you was growing up or in your mother when you were growing up that troubled you that all down through your life as a teenager, as an adolescent, as a married woman, as a married man, as a business person, those things come knocking at your door and they try to manifest through you like you saw manifest in your dad or your grandfather, your mother, your grandmother. They try to come and knock on your door and they try to manifest in your life. But thanks be to God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, they cannot get to first base. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. We wrestle against it. And there's things that I wrestle with all my life. I wrestle against it. People wrestle against low self-esteem. People wrestle against issues of their personality. They wrestle with authenticity. Day and night wrestling, trying to constantly grapple with, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Rage, anger issues, sexual perversion tendencies, addiction tendencies, 
past sins that you saw in the bloodline of your family tries to crop up in your children and your grandchildren. It's things that we wrestle against. But don't stop fighting. Wrestle it to the very end. Somebody give God praise. People fight. People fight against those things that they have seen close up and personal growing up around their mothers and fathers and their brothers and sisters. There's things that's tried to manifest in your brothers and sisters that could not manifest in you because you're saved. You're washed in the blood. So you want to do good, but you constantly wrestle. I remember Steve Hill. He was a drug addict, and he was an evangelist at the Brownsville Revival. And he was a drug addict, and God delivered him of drugs, made him a preacher, and he's a powerful preacher, the most powerful repentance preacher I've ever had the privilege of knowing. We worked together for years in the Brownsville Revival. People came by the millions. But I remember he told me one night, one Saturday night, sitting on the platform, he said, even though God saved me and even though God delivered me from drugs, I fight with drugs every day of my life. He said, I wrestle with that addiction every day of my life. And I remember one time I got, I fell and got hurt really bad and had to be put in the hospital. I broke my body up really bad. And so they put me in the hospital and morphine wouldn't touch my pain. And so they put me on Dilata. And I was in the hospital on Sunday morning. He came by church, came by before church one Sunday morning to see me. Brenda was sitting in the room with me and he said, Pastor, he said, man, you look peaceful. I said, I am. He said, what they got you on? I said, they tried morphine, but it wouldn't touch my pain. They got me on Delata. He said, oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus, he said, Delata was my drug of choice. Slide over. <laughs> <laughs> but till the day he died, he wrestled with that addiction and he never went back to it. Let me say this to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. Go ahead. There comes times because of you know what's going on in your life. Because you know who you are. Because you know what's going on in your family and your bloodline. There comes times that you've got to fight for your life. You've got to fight for your sanity. You've got to fight for your ministry. You've got to fight for your marriage. And you've got to fight for your future. Don't ever stop wrestling in Jesus' name. I remember reading a scripture years ago. I preached it at Brownsville. I remember the Sunday I preached it. And I remember whenever I preached it, it really ministered to me. The scripture did. It's found in 2 Timothy 2.25 in King James Version. It said, in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves. Can I tell you something? Sometime... You oppose yourself as your greatest enemy, and you're going to have to stop that. Look at that scripture. In meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You can come in church. You can sing. They can start that stuff on the organ and the keyboard and the guitar. I wanted to jump up with two bad knees and run, but I couldn't. And, and you can help, you can, you can get, be in church and have the greatest time. But whenever you get alone, you oppose yourself all over again. You say such horrible things to yourself. You criticize yourself. Stop wrestling with yourself. Wrestle with Satan, but stop wrestling with yourself. Become yourself's best friend. I remember years ago when I first got into ministry. I had people that would oppose me, people that would fight me and make fun of me and, and come against me. And I made up my mind one day, I'm not going to be a coloring book that I'm going to walk around and let somebody just turn to a page and color me the way they see me. I said, God, I know who I am. I know whose I am. 
and I know that I'm on the way to glory. I'm not who they say I am. I will not let them open me up and color me. I know that in, in whom I have believed, and I believe that you're able to keep me until the day of my departure. Don't let people color you. Don't let people color you. Don't let them turn to page 12 and color you the way they see you. It's not the way they see you. It's the way heaven sees you and the way the Holy Spirit sees you. Come on, give God praise. I want to talk to you about wrestling with people issues. I'm not talking about physically fighting with people. I pastored five churches. I pastored two in Georgia, one in Indiana, one in Pensacola, and one in Daphne, Alabama. One thing I've learned about pastoring, <laughs> several things I've learned about pastoring. <laughs> but let me tell you one thing I've learned about pastoring. You may be pastoring this church and somebody's giving you the devil, or several people are giving you the devil. And they're coming against you. They're trying to undermine you. They're trying to defame you among the congregation. They're withstanding you. And you're thinking, boy, if I could just get another church somewhere. Man, if I could just move from Alabama or Tennessee to Michigan, everything would be better. But here's what I learned. No matter where you move, they'll have different color hair. They'll have a different style body. They'll have a different name. But the same spirit that fought you where you came from will fight you where you're going. You're going to have to learn to wrestle no matter where you are. Woo! I'm preaching better than y'all acting. I'm not talking about fighting people. I'm not talking about wrestling with flesh and blood. I'm not talking about Joe and Susie. That's not your problem. You know, the devil wants you to get in the boxing ring with somebody. You know, put on your shorts, put on your boxing gloves, climb over the ropes and get in the ring. The devil's going to beat your brains out. Stay out of the ring because your warfare is not with flesh and blood. Our warfare is with powers and principalities, but we've been given great weapons of warfare, and God said they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. Don't fall for that physical stuff. Get your mighty weapons of God. Let me talk a little bit about fighting people issues. I don't know if you've ever seen this or not. But the Bible says that Jacob had two wives. He had Leah and he had Rachel. When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister Leah. And she said to Jacob, give me children or I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I God? Who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, going under her. Does that sound familiar? Going under her, and she'll bear upon my knees that I may have children also by her. So she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in under her. Bilhah conceived, bare Jacob a son. Rachel said, God has judged me, and he's also heard my voice. He's given me a son, therefore she called his name Dan. Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare a son, second son. And Rachel said, with great wrestling, have I wrestled with my sister. And I have prevailed, and she called his name Naphtali. I want to talk to you for a moment about wrestling and being in competition with other people. Being in competition. And look what it says there. Look what it says. Rachel said, with great wrestlings, have I wrestled with my sister. She could have children. 
but Rachel couldn't have children. Her womb was shut. Leah's was open. Leah had Reuben. She had Simon. She had Judah. She had all kinds of children. Her womb was shut. And because her sister was able to function in a function that Rachel wanted so bad, she was in competition with her sister and wrestling a wrestling match that was impossible to win. And there's people every day on their job. They go in and they wrestle with the co-workers. There's, there's preachers that wrestle with other preachers because their church is not that size as another preacher's church. And their church doesn't have this program that that church has. And they're in competition with them. And they're always wrestling. And they're always feeling inferior. And they're always feeling like somebody else has got something they don't have. It's a wrestling match. And God says stop wrestling within yourself. Among yourselves. Be sick. Just be content with what you have. We wrestle, struggling with comparisons, a mental image, a mental image. You struggle with your hair. You struggle with your breast. You don't feel like your breast is what they ought to be. You don't feel like your, your walk, like you want to walk. You don't feel like your weight is ever what you want it to be. And you see somebody else come in, and they're beautiful, and they're shapely, and they weigh just the right amount, and all the men look at them, and you feel like you're struggling against that person now. And you're in competition with that person. I've seen it in worship teams. That somebody comes in, and they've got great pipes. And they've got great stage presence. And when they get up to worship, everybody really gets into worship. And the other ones have been here for three years. And not that much has happened. But you begin to struggle and to wrestle in the worship team. How can you have a move of the Holy Spirit if you're wrestling on the platform? Come on, give God praise. Whoa. These are issues that we wrestle with at every turn. Trying to break out of boundaries. Trying to break out of political structures. There's pastors who, past, who battle with issues of always feeling like they don't want to go to ministerial meetings because I can't stand him because he's got such a great ministry. And you wrestle with that. Wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. Number three, when we wrestle with powers and principalities, I want to talk about this for a moment. This is important. The Bible said we wrestle not against blood, but dark angels, entities. We wrestle with demons, dark spirits, and spirits that oppose us at almost every turn. I came to be introduced to this demonic world when I was a teenager. And I'm going to tell you some stories that I have never really told except to my own people. Many of you heard me tell when I was here first time, I think I told about the angels that came into our church. You remember that? The angels that came into our church when I was a boy, 14 years old. I'm glad God let me see the angels first. Because the angels were powerful, big, huge. And they represented everything that has brought me peace since I saw them when I was 14 years old. It changed my life. Even the things that I face in the ministry today, I face those things with a confidence because I was able, God let me see angels come in that church that night. And they, I don't know how long they stayed, but it was awesome to see. We actually saw them in the dark. We was in the dark. In 17, I was saw them. It was a powerful experience. But I remember one night I was in a prayer meeting. I was praying for the pastor. I prayed with him for years without missing a night. We never missed one night, seven nights a week, even after church on Wednesday night, after church on Sunday night. We never missed a prayer meeting. We never missed a time. We'd start at 1130. Pastor would lay on the floor, in the dark, take his tie off, 
take his coat off, had a white shirt on, he'd put his hand under his head. He'd lay there for 30 minutes from 11.30 to 12 o'clock at night telling preacher stories. He'd tell us about how people had been saved in his ministry and brush arbors and camp meetings and things like that. He'd tell us about healings. He'd tell us about deliverances. He's a prolific storyteller. And then at midnight, we'd start praying. Every night, we'd start praying at midnight, and he'd tell stories from 11.30 to 12. But when we'd start praying, he taught us to pray. He, and most of the nights, it was just me and Pastor. Some nights, there was five or six there, but this night, there happened to be 17 of us there. And when the angels came in. So I remember one night, we was there praying, just me and Pastor. And when I first started praying with him, I felt so awkward because I was in this church with an old man every night. And I was a teenager. And I just felt so awkward. It just felt like, you know, man, good gracious. What am I doing here? I'm a teenager. I'm in a prayer meeting with this old man. But I didn't know it, but that was setting the stage for where God was going to take me in my life. And so we was in there praying. And we'd already seen the angels about a year before that. But this particular night, it felt strange in the church. And I remember I saw an entity in the dark in the church. And not only saw it, but I heard it. It was shrieking with laughter. And it looked like a monkey that was on the back of a pew, just like this pew right here. And he was turning somersaults sideways like this with a long tail. And he was laughing out loud at me and Pastor. Pastor got up off of the floor where he'd been praying, and he always called me out. He said, out? Where are you? I said, I'm over here, Pastor. He said, don't come to me, I'll come to you. He said, do you see what I see? I said, yes, I see it. He said, what do you see? I said, it looks like a monkey, and he's turning somersault sideways, and he's laughing at us. He said, you're seeing correctly. Stay there, I'll come to you. And he came over there to me. And he stood right by my side and he said, now watch this. I want to show you how you deal with this. He said, stay right behind me. And he walked right up to that monkey. It looked like a monkey, but it wasn't a demon. And he said, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and I rebuke you. Get out! It was like a bubble busted. And it just disappeared. You see, as long as the devil can get you con confused and get you fighting Susie and get you fighting Joe, the devil's having a heyday continuing to do what he's been doing all along. You're focused on this and you're not focused on him. Our warfare is not with flesh and blood. It is with powers and entities and dark spirits. Don't you ever doubt it. I remember I had... This guy that would come in, I'd bring him in occasionally from Poland, and he was a missionary. They shocked him so many times, and they beat him so many times under Ceausescu for being a Christian. They shocked him until all of his teeth had fallen out. And they beat him. This man took terrible persecution for being a Christian and a minister. So I'd have him come to Brownsville, and I'd let him preach. And he'd preach, and his grandson would interpret for him. So I remember he came in and he preached one Sunday night at Brownsville and he loved soup and Brenda would cook soup. My wife would cook soup for him and uh, he'd love to eat her soup. And so <clears throat> after he got through preaching, I stayed on the platform for a while. We had a good crowd that night. He was down there praying for people. And while he was praying for people, I was about to walk down off the stage on the main floor, and I saw, out of the corner of my eye, I saw like a leopard leave a woman. I didn't see his head, I didn't see his front paws, but I saw his rear paws, I saw his tail, and I saw about the last half of his body, and he came out of this woman. He was orange and had black spots. And when I saw it, I knew I saw it, and nobody could convince me I didn't see it, but I tried to convince myself that I didn't see it. So I went home that night, and they left church early because Brenda went home and got a suit for him, and I didn't get away from the church till late, and I got home. When I walked in the dining room, 
he put his spoon down. He said, you saw it, didn't you, through his grandson. I said, saw what? He said, you know what I'm talking about. I saw your face when you saw it. You saw that leopard jump out of that woman. I said, I sure did. So in my life, I've had the opportunity to not only see the powerful angelic world, but I've had several manifestations in my life of seeing the world of supernatural powers and principalities. And our warfare is not with people. Our warfare is with those spirits. If your church ever starts having trouble, it's not really sister so-and-so. It's the spirit of division that's trying to tear your church up. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I said, are you listening to what I'm saying? Stop fighting her, stop fighting him, and start going into prayer before God. And prayer meetings should not just be prayer meetings. They ought to be wrestling matches where we pin these things to the mat and say, no, no, no. I will not allow you to destroy my church. I will not allow you to destroy my children, my grandchildren, my pastor, my pastor's wife. You will not do it. And prayer meetings need to become wrestling matches. We need to forget this dignity stuff about church and come in and be just passionate about protecting the presence of God. Come on, give God praise for a minute. I feel that. Woo! Come on, lift your hands. Lift your voice. We wrestle. We wrestle. If you're one of these Christians that wants church to be nice and rosy, you are in the wrong place. If the devil has a church like that, he's already got that church under his control. The ones that the devil is fighting is the ones that will wrestle with him and say, no, 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 not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. You're not going to help my family. You're not going to help my church. I refuse it in the name of Jesus. I want to show you an interesting scripture. You might be sitting here tonight and you might be thinking, Oh, Brother Kilpatrick, that's not church. Well, let's see what God had to say about it. In Judges chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, the Bible says that the Lord said, these are the nations that the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who did not have any previous battle experience. Look at this. Look at this. God left some enemies to teach the Israelites' children how to fight. Look at it. Back up, verse 1. These are the nations that the Lord left. He left them. In other words, he didn't let Israel drive them all out. He said, no, let these stay. Why? Because those Israelites who had never had any experience in wars in Canaan, it said... He did this only to teach warfare to their children who had no previous battle experience. In other words, what God wants you to do is he wants you to wrestle. He wants you to fight. This, this rosy, cushy Christianity that preachers preach today is not in the real world. You better learn how to fight. I said you better learn how to fight. Every day of my life, whenever I pastored Brownsville, all five years of, the, of my life, I fought every single day. Every single day I had to fight. I got out of the bed in the morning. I went in and got dressed. It was like I reached over and picked up a pole vault. I climbed a high ladder. I stepped out on a rope, a tight rope, with a pole like this every day for five years trying to keep my balance and keep that revival from going in the ditch. 
I was fighting powers and principalities and rulers of the darkness of this present world. When revival broke out, I was a casual, ordinary pastor in an ordinary city in America. But when revival broke out, it thrust me into an arena I had no idea existed. If that revival was going to be protected, I had to fight. I had to fight. I want to ask you a question. Is your church worth fighting for? I said, is your church worth fighting for? Well, fight! Is your family worth fighting for? Is your grandchildren and your children worth fighting for? Well, fight for them! Don't give them over to the devil. Fight! Oh, my God, I feel that. Come on. Give God praise. Whenever the Supreme Court passed that law and President Obama lit the White House up in the colors of the rainbow. I know this is a black church, but it's time you buckle up and face the truth. Don't you give me no grief over it. This is not about a man. This is about fighting. Ever since that happened, this nation was knocked back over hundreds of years, all the way back to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Homosexuality was sanctioned overnight. And this nation saw firsthand a president and a nation embrace same-sex marriage. And what God had ordained was knocked in the ground. And we've been wrestling ever since with that spirit. We must realize it's time to get out of the dirt and fight again for what we hold dear. Whoa! You're going to learn me, friend. I don't mind telling you what I think. But I love President Obama. I love President Trump. I love President Bush. I love them all. But I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm an independent. I'm a blood-washed, Holy Ghost-filled, tongue-talking Christian. It's time to tell the truth. It's time to tell the truth. It's time to fight for our country. Have you ever seen America in the shape that it's in right now? You ever seen such division? Have you ever seen, today they put a box of chicken in the place of the Attorney General and called him a chicken for not showing back up today. That's not politics. That's not government. That's insidious warfare. Our warfare is not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. You remember when Kavanaugh was being interviewed before the Senate Judiciary Committee? for the position on the Supreme Court. You remember when the people were screaming out? That was not people screaming, that was demons. That was demons screaming out, saying, don't let him on the court! Because they knew that if certain ones gets on that court, they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade. They know it. Listen, they know it. They know it's going to happen. And that was demons crying out. You think that's something? Just wait till you see what comes down the pike in a few, day, a few weeks or a few years from now. That was nothing compared to what the warfare is going to become. We must fight. Yeah. One thing I can tell you about dark spirits is they target anointed church leaders. And they target worship teams that are anointed. They target places just like this right here. They'll do whatever they can to minimize the anointing in this house. They'll do whatever they can to make this place so contaminated and feel so defiled to people when they walk in the doors back there, they won't ever want to come back because they feel all that in the atmosphere. You have to fight for the atmosphere of your church. Let me share one more thing before I change the subject. I made myself really vulnerable when I preached this at my church a couple of weeks, and I'm going to make myself vulnerable here tonight. You look at somebody like myself and you think, he never fights anything. 
Friend, you just don't know. I've been preaching for over 50 years. I started preaching before I married my wife, and we've been married 51 years this July. I've been pastoring for many, many decades. I have preached thousands of sermons. And I can assure you, out of the thousands of sermons I've preached, I have never gone home from preaching a sermon over 10 or 15 times at the most and felt good about it. And all the sermons that I've preached, thousands of them, I've never gone home and felt good about a sermon that I preached. Why? Because when God gives you a sermon, the devil starts fighting you immediately as soon as you get it. Starts fighting you immediately as soon as you get the information. And when you get the information and you're trying to make your notes and you're trying to get it in your spirit to get ready to preach, hell will start condemning you. Yeah. Oh, you think you're going to preach that? Oh, you think they're going to listen to you? Who do you think you are? Other preachers have tried to preach that and faltered and failed on their face. Who do you think you are? You're not going to be able to preach that. And then after you get the message and you stand up to preach it, from the time you open your Bible and start preaching, you hear a voice in your ear condemning you the whole time. Oh, you left out so-and-so. Look at the people. They're not even getting this. Some of them are sleeping out there. The whole time you're preaching, you have to wrestle. You have to wrestle. I said you have to wrestle. You wrestle when you get the message. You wrestle when you preach the message. And then after you preach the message, you wrestle and condemn yourself because you don't feel like you did a good enough job. You wrestle all the time. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Church is not some kind of a safe zone where everybody's nice and everything is good and smells good. Everybody, it's a war. It's a battlefield. Woo! I know you're laughing at that, but friend, it's not funny to the one that gets it and the one that preaches it and the one that has to go home and put up with a stink after you preach it. It is a battle. Let me close. Jacob was left alone. He wrestled with a man until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And the man said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. And Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. And he said, What is your name? And you know, when Jacob said, What is name? I'm a deceiver and I'm a swimmer. How many of you knows when you start wrestling with God, He's going to get out of you what you really are? Yeah. What's your name, son? And he said, my name is Swindler and a deceiver. And he grabbed hold of the Lord. And he said, I won't let you go. And what he was saying is, I don't want the kind of blessing that I got because I cheated my brother out of the blessing. I cheated my brother out of the birthright. I've already got that. I don't want that. I want you to bless me. I want you to change me. I want my nature to be changed. I don't want to be the same person. I'm going to hang on to you until you touch me. And here's what God said. God said, well, your name is not going to anymore be called Jacob. Because his name meant swindler or deceiver. He said, I'm going to change your name to Prince of Israel. I'm going to change your name to Israel. It means Prince with God and what God was saying is I'm not going to let you go until you give me the worst part of your personality and I'm going to give you the gift of your destiny of who I always meant for you to be but it was a wrestling match it was a wrestling match now I close the Lord said Lead us not to temptation. And then he shifted. He didn't say for the eyes of the kingdom and the power and the glory, but he said, a man 
has got some guests coming. He goes to his friend's house, capital F. And he says, I've got some guests coming. I don't have anything to set before them. Would you please help me? He said, no, I'm already in the bed with the kids in the bed with me to sleep. And then Jesus reveals this about the Father. And he said, because he knows of the man's importunity, and he knows he won't let him rest, he's going to keep on keeping on. He said he'll get up and give him whatever he asks. Could I say this to you? Lay hold of God and don't give up until he gives you what you ask him. Lay hold of God. Lay hold of God and don't give up until he gives you what he asks you. And here's what I want to do tonight in closing. I'm not going to be able to pray long because I'm having some struggle here tonight with, with some pain. It's not as bad as it has been. But I'm going to ask those of you that you're struggling with competition, you're struggling with those inner voices, you're struggling with someone in comparisons, you're struggling with an entity, some kind of a strong bull demon spirit that's come into your family, your life, that's coming against some of your loved ones, and some of you are really in contention with God. You're laying hold of God and saying, God, I've got to change. I can't remain the same. If you're here, I want you just to get up right now. I want you to put that song on back there for me, guys, in the, in the sound booth. I want you to put that music on the lentils for me. And if you're here and you want prayer, I want you to come forward quickly, and I want to lay hands on you and pray for you. Everybody stand up. See your heart and everything you've made Every burning star is seen